Welcome in to another special edition of Sportball. I'm your boy, Sam. All of our listeners, boys. I'm boys with all of them. With me, as always, are my, I would say, acquaintances at best, Seth and Kyle. Boys, how are we doing? Greetings, greetings. I'm in the uh, beautiful state of Minnesota right now, land of mm, 10,000 lakes. Time here. Really 11,000. Um, so are you reporting that good. live? I am. You found another 1,000 lakes? <laughs> They're always here. It just doesn't make a snappy logo, slogan, not logo. <laughs> Poor logo, really. I mean, who's going to draw 11,000 lakes? Yeah, 10,000 <laughs> is easy to draw. But... <laughs> Kyle, how are you doing over there with the newborn? Uh, good, you know, living life day by day. Just had our house cleaned. By you or by someone else? Oh, I know. Fancy. Did you use the Euro maids like the Scully family always does? No, certainly not. No, <laughs> you'd never spring for the Euro maids. <laughs> yeah, so when does a newborn a whistle. become just a baby? You know, I was thinking that. I, I was thinking, ah, maybe it's not newborn anymore. I mean, she's still a newborn. I think you mean- how much, no, how much is, how, how old is she now? It's only been like almost months. two months. Oh, okay. I would say after two months, let's, let's switch it from newborn to baby. Can I go behind that? Let me call it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's something on Google that says, you know, yeah, typical, but whatever, but we don't you. care about that. Let me get people on. start asking. I'm just going to start referring to it in weeks, but I'm not going to say weeks. I'm just going to be like, she's 12. <laughs> I feel like some people like they'll be like, uh, she's 19 months old, dude. I'm like, okay, craziest thing there was. (laughs) I was at um, an allergy shot appointment when I was younger, and Mm -hmm. there was I have this vivid memory of this lady there with her kid, and someone else, uh, another person was there with their kid, and they asked how old the one person's kid was, and the lady responded. He's 68 months old. (laughs) I swear to God, it hasn't left my memory since that day. How old were you when you witnessed this? Is it like a core memory for you? Uh, I was (laughs) probably like eight or nine. It's like an inside out when you have the core memories. That's the one for you when someone said 68 weeks. (laughs) Wild, dude. Who does that? Uh, That's good. Well, certainly this pod isn't a, a baby pod, okay, for babies. It's for adults who like the pod. I mean, Matt listens, so. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We should start doing over under to how many minutes we mentioned Matt into the podcast because that was like <laughs> maybe three. <laughs> that and over under on when he texts us about the podcast after it drops. Yeah, last week he texted me to say I wasn't his boy, which I feel like is inaccurate, but you know, outrageous. To hear it over there. Yeah. So this week, we did our NFL preview on the last pod, and this week we're kind of we're kind of here to maybe roll back our takes, or at least, <laughs> well, I know that me and Seth will say surprises that differ from our our preview podcast, our takes on the preview, but Kyle will say surprises that actually just back up whatever he said in the preview <laughs> podcast. So I look forward to that. <laughs> that would be on brand, yeah. So this is the big NFL two week surprise summer blowout bonanza, and we're just gonna. Each of us, I gave you guys a task. We'll see if you did it to each pick three surprises over the first two weeks of the NFL season. Basically, either a player, a team, or whatever whatever it might be that um, has either performed differently in a negative way or a positive way from what you expected them to do this season. And I also want you to report to me if you think it will sustain for the rest of the season. Does everyone do their homework? I can't speak for everyone. It's not, if I look at you, both your faces, it looks like no. I will start. <laughs> no, I did. Good. I will start with a little surprise that I teased to you guys earlier. And that's the Falcons of Atlanta. God, it just, this team, every year it fucks me one way, another way. Disgusting. Either I like them and they're bad, I hate them and they're good. I mean, what's to be done here? I did, as you recall in the preview pod, say that they would make the playoffs this year and they are now 0-2. You know, playoffs perhaps not out of reach. And yet I believe it's like 90% of teams that start 0-2 don't make the playoffs. So pretty much out of reach. Um they got trounced by Philly week one. And then they <laughs> they lost to the Bucks 
48 25 over the weekend. But, you know, They're the Bucks. to lose to the Bucks is no embarrassment. To lose to Philly, who just got trounced again by the Niners, you know, maybe a little embarrassing. Philly's a fine team, but. Um, what do you mean again? Again, when? What he says they got trounced again by the Niners. By the Niners. Oh. Again, you know, like in another game, they got trounced. You know, everyone gets trounced by the Niners. You get trounced here, you get trounced there. Trounces all around. <laughs> you, so, so Philly won the first week. You just said that. They did. So they got trounced again. Yes. I'm just trying to clear it up for the listeners. I think I just said again on accident, but Kyle cut that all out in post. All right. So once again, <laughs> you know, I know he won't. Edit. <laughs> uh, so anyway. The loss to Philly, perhaps an embarrassment. The loss to the Bucks, not. But still, this team is at 0-2. Arthur Smith has not made an impact on the red zone efficiency that I thought he might. Last year, this team was at 54% red zone efficiency, which is one of the worst in the league. This year, small sample size, of course, but they're at 50, which is even worse, you might say. Mm. So, did you do that really, math in your head? No. It really – I did 54 minus 50 on my calculator, and it said minus 4, so I got confused, and I had to do it again, and then I figured out – How it does it say minus 4 if you did 54 <laughs> minus 50? Your calculator is weird broke. calculator. Dude, calculator dude. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing is Matt Ryan, who is my QB2 in the ACT league, uh, unfortunately seems really to be washed, good. washed up onto the beach like a beached whale. Um, I didn't see it coming. I thought he still had some left in the tank. If this man gets any pressure on him, and we, we often talk about this as like kind of the biggest indicator of when a quarterback is past the point where he can be effective. If he feels any pressure, it's game over, right? He's, he's thrown into the dirt, maybe he's throwing an interception, but he can't handle it. And the defense is still ass, okay? 80 points allowed in two games, which I don't think is very good. You guys can tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, 40 points per game, mm. probably not the greatest <laughs> greatest defense. So the real test is this week against the Giants, who I lamented on this podcast in the preview and said they would be hit their under, which is looking pretty good so far. So if they lose to the Giants, I finally wash my hands of them. I have confirmed the Falcons have given up the most points in the league through two games. Which isn't where you want to be, I would say, if you're (laughs) trying to make the playoffs. Uh, So I do think this will sustain in regards to them being – a poor team. I mean, they're not going to be 0 17 or anything, but I think I'm rolling back the playoff take and, and envisioning maybe a 6 and 11, 7 and 10, 8 and 9 kind of season. And yeah, maybe they move on questions. from Matt Ryan at the end of the season. Yes, go ahead. Two follow up questions. What has your assessment been so far of Kyle Pitts? Hmm. And number two, if you were Arthur Smith, what would you do differently? So, Thank you for your follow-up. You're welcome. recognize this, Seth. Uh, Kyle has looked pretty good from what I've seen. I mean, I I think he's just kind of like tied to Matt Ryan is the unfortunate part. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Kyle looks good. (laughs) Not Kyle Olsen of the pod, but instead Kyle Pitts. Is that the first time I've said your full name? No, I've been doxxed for like the fourth (laughs) time on the show. (laughs) He's plastered over every newspaper around the country. (laughs) So I think, I mean, I still have faith in Kyle Pitts. It's just that his quarterback, unfortunately, has moved into the spaghetti arm phase of his career. Uh, Arthur Smith, he looked a little better last week from what I saw. But there's been a lot of running up the middle with Cordero Patterson, and I'm not really sure what the the goal in mind is there. there's been a few fourth down situations where questionable calls, I feel like perhaps, and this could change, you know, his, his first year as head coach, perhaps he's one of those great offensive minds that, you know, isn't quite ready to take on the decision-making that a head coach has to have right in, in all situations. So that's kind of what I've seen so far, you know, it could turn out that he, he molds into a good coach, but certainly hasn't looked that way from the first couple of weeks, at least as a casual observer. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I, they're <laughs> speechless. <laughs> I haven't watched uh, anything other than like NFL primetime highlights of the Falcons this year. So you have the guts to ask me those questions? <laughs> well, I wanted to know the answers because I haven't watched them. So I was curious to hear. Thank you. 
for attending my TED talk on the Falcons. Kyle, any, uh, any input? No, still as high as I could be on, <laughs> on Kyle Pitts, you know, it's a, he's a generational tight end talent, but like you said, when you're attached to a quarterback that has he's no attached. protection. Yeah. Yeah. Has no, <laughs> we've no never seen a Siamese twin make it in the NFL. Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't give up some... your dreams kids. <laughs> Some people are saying Kyle Pitts might be even more talented than Chris Herndon. So, <laughs> whoa, let's not get can accomplish here. that. Those people, man, I'll find them. <laughs> Kyle, anytime you can, you can back a player that has your same first name and his last name is a body part that's unsavory. <laughs> you're with him for the long haul, right? I mean, I can't wait for Kyle Scrutum to enter the league. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my first surprise. It's a negative one, and it saddens me. Um, someone else, bring me back up with your surprise. Uh, I can go next. I'm going to start off. Her cousins. Just... That's not I a surprise. A surprise. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start off. Yeah, actually, I was actually going to start off by saying, well, one team that will not be on this surprise list is the Minnesota Vikings, who did the most Vikings things out, thing ever by – missing a 37 yard field goal to lose the game uh, while they were in that position down one only because they missed an extra point earlier in the game. So classic. Vikings and I was going to say Seth real quick in the Vikings, I, I wrote them down in honorable mentions and all I wrote was like Vikings 0-1-2 expected them to compete for playoffs. And then my second line was, but they're the Vikings. So not surprised. <laughs> Correct. Um, so moving on, this is, maybe a little bit of cheating because it wasn't really the whole two weeks. It was mostly just week one, but I wanted to mention it. And I think it's an interesting conversation. So Aaron Rodgers, just an abysmal week one. And what I thought was the most surprising about this was just from some other podcasts I've listened to. It sounds like there at least was after that, uh, a significant contingent of Packers fans who turned against him and were basically ready to trade him away. And obviously I'm no stranger to being a fan of a team and want wanting their quarterback on a different team, but, and I'm sure, you know, it's not like everyone at Lambeau is going to boo him. Right. Yeah. I think that was more like a straw man theme, you know, the more, the more talkative people on Twitter are the ones with the strongest opinions. Right. Yeah. That that definitely could be, but regardless, like everyone kind of felt like I I felt that the net, that the biggest consensus was after all the turmoil in the off season, some people questioning Aaron Rodgers' dedication to the sport, to the team that he would then have this fuck you attitude and go and light it up like he normally does. So I was shocked with the week one performance, just a complete dud. And then, of course, rebounded against the Lions. But even the Wolf Alliance, um, who I might come back to later on, sneak peek, uh, really stuck with them in the first half, at least, before Aaron Jones just took over. So I think that's more of a sentiment to the Packers defense and how atrocious that looks this year. Cause it's yeah, horrendous. So, right. I mean, obviously Aaron Rodgers made all the big headlines after game, after game one, but nobody on the Packers offense or defense was really doing anything in that game. So you can't really lay all the blame on, on him. So I was just surprised that they weren't their typical green Bay selves and they had a bounce back game against the lions and I do think that that will continue and they'll get back to their former glory and will ultimately uh, win the division as we would have predicted preseason. We also so. didn't predict Justin Fields to be starting by week three, though. That you division think better things? watch out. Kyle, I gave you the chance to pick the Bears in the last week and you didn't. So are you, mm. <laughs> is this it? Is this your – are you picking them now? Picking them for what? Surprises? The division. The, no. Oh, the division? No. <laughs> but I am saying watch out. 
Watch out. The Packers might not win a division. That's one of the worst in, in the NFL. Uh, yeah. I think that that Saints game was maybe the most surprising the first week. Right. But in retrospect, it kind of makes sense. Like, I mean, the Saints have a solid defense um, and, you know, at least offensively, there maybe wasn't going to be a lot of chemistry there because, you know, Rodgers obviously wasn't at training camp, didn't play in the preseason. You know, none of these guys have played together in the preseason. And then not surprising that they beat the lowly Lions, right? So I'll be interested to see how they perform going forward. But, yeah, I expect them to be a, a very good team that wins the division. I was actually a little surprised. I guess this happens every week one, but there was such an overreaction to that loss to the Saints. And I was never worried about it. Kyle wasn't worried about it. He picked them in Survivor. Good on Kyle. And I said I'm picking whatever team is playing the Lions every week that I can where it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so I think – So I was just going to say there's – You go first. You go first. No, I insist. Um, I insist <laughs> that I go next. Um, <laughs> we're kind of doing two in a row on me, but please, whatever. It's our podcast. So my other one was going to be my surprise was that the Lions have almost kind of been frisky, even though they're own two. Um, and also, even though we make fun of Sam when he says teams are frisky, because that's really just a way of saying their ass. But they've been competitive in both of their first two games against who we think to be very good playoff lock opponents, right? So obviously their defense is trash and they can't stop anybody, but, you know, Jared Goff and that offense seems to be putting things together. The running game looks all right. Um, you know, DeAndre Swift seems to have taken some kind of step up. Um, they've got a competent backup with Jamal Williams, getting some passing game work. And so, I mean, the Lions, I think, probably have the best offensive line in the division. So <laughs> that helps strong. a lot. <laughs> right. So that was a surprise for me. I kind of just had written them off as, oh, that team's ass. You know, they're going from – a team led by Matthew Stafford that was already ass and now replacing him with Jared Goff, like that's not going to go well. Um, But they've shown a lot of heart and really hung with teams a a decent amount. And I'm guessing that will not continue. I would predict that they'll kind of continue to tumble um, in the, in the standings and, maybe even on on an emotional or like mental level when you come kind of close, but still end up 0-2 and you know, this isn't the year for you and your defense can't stop anybody. Eventually that losing might get to you. So. Yeah. I gotta say, I'm actually not surprised at all by the Lions start or the Texans start kind of a similar team. I, I know a lot of people were talking about betting for them for worst record in the league, which obviously might still happen for both teams, but I did expect both those teams to be competitive from the start, just for the simple fact there's a lot of veterans in both those teams. Um, You know, you might expect the Jets or the Jaguars with their rookie quarterbacks to start off, you know, and be less competitive, but you have Tyrod Taylor, a veteran in this league, who's, you know, a fine starting quarterback, you know, unless someone stabs him with a needle again, you know, fingers crossed. And you have Jared Goff, who's, I mean, he's fine. He's not Matthew Stafford, as we see, obviously. But so, and you have, like you said, Seth Jamal Williams. You have Mark Ingram and, and the Texans, right? Kind of similar with his veteran presence, good for the locker room. So I wasn't too surprised that both those teams started out competitive. But like you said, I kind of expect as the losing goes on and injuries pile up and just kind of fatigue, you know, from losing, I think they will become less competitive as the season goes on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't help, you know, that they lost Agnew for the season before this. Is it Agnew, right? Is that their cornerback? Is that who I'm thinking of? Oh, the Lions cornerback, Adoka? Yeah. Oh, that's what I meant. Why was I thinking of Agnew? Someone else um, named Agnew to get injured. So, yeah. Okay. That's why. And then his replacement got injured against the Packers. So, oh, really? I missed good. that. <laughs> that's yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, but I am 
intrigued to see how their wide receiver core plays out because I was a fan of Quintez Cephas coming out of college. He's a good, uh, I mean, he's a terrible human, um, oh. but he did, he did. Part. Yeah. Yeah. I think he had some uh, domestic assault case, which made him lose a year at Wisconsin. Um but he did break out as wide receiver in college in his second year, but what, like a 19 year old or something like that. I mean, he looks like he's the real deal so far. And Amon Ross St. Brown looks great already too. Um, I mean, he was an elite slot receiver in college and that seems to be the position he's where he's running for the, for Detroit. Um, so I know I said not too long ago, that I'd be picking against them every week that I could. If the team that's playing them has a good offense, but a bad defense, I will not be picking against Detroit. I thought he was going to say, even though I said I was going to pick against them every week, I think they win this division easily. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, DeAndre Swift looks great. The one-two punch with Williams looks good too. Hawkinson looks as good as ever. Probably going to be uh, what he might be a top four tight end this year. I think that, oh, yeah. yes, easily. I think that they have some pieces there with the lines. I feel pretty good about their rebuild so far. Um, I mean, we'll see how that cornerback comes back from his injury, but you want to build in the trenches first, right? And they have an, already a very good offensive line and a good run game. And it, like you said, a great tight end. So Jared Goff, probably a rental, I would imagine, not part of their long term future plans. So they got to figure that part out. The most position, the most important position, you might say, but I think they're building something there, and I like, I like what I said. But hey, Jared Goff loses them enough games, and they get like a top three pick and grab a quarterback next year. Yeah, I mean, you I, give I them- feel like I feel like our our tide will turn on Detroit very quick if that happens. I mean, you give you give that anyone in that organization truth serum. That's what they'd say they prefer. So, <laughs> and that's probably what's going to happen. So, yeah, I think the future is brighter there. Uh, Kyle, for the love of God, Kyle, give us one of your surprises. It's not a surprise to me. Here we go. <laughs> Rondell Moore is the truth, and we've always known it. <laughs> what? Do you understand the prompt? It's supposed it's to be surprising to you. No, oh. that's not what the prompt is. But how was I ever going to talk about Rondell then? <laughs> Just go ahead. <laughs> I knew he'd do it. I mean... We've seen him only through two games already. 24% uh, of the offensive snaps week one, up to 50% of the snaps week two. Him and Kyler seem to have developed some incredible chemistry when they were working for Willy Wonka at the Chocolate Factory. They're both like four foot two. Um, sorry, I had to explain did that. Did you it just much sneak better. in an Oopa Loopa joke out of our very <laughs> eyes? I sure did. Yeah, no one got it until I explained it, so goes to show um i know small sample as we've said it's only two weeks in rondo is averaging 14.3 yards after the catch this season he's the anti mike evans the that's the perfect analogy is it is that an analogy not an analogy uh what would it be a statement i suppose i was trying to think of what the word is for the opposite yeah something like that who knows either way um we're just going to see him get better and better um he really opens it up for uh carolina i feel carolina what the fuck am i talking about (laughs) cardinals for the cardinals i feel like Um, that's your favorite team you can't even remember where they're from (laughs) i almost wore my hat but i didn't want to go back upstairs and get my cardinals hat um naturally but yeah i mean we knew if they kept kind of running the the horizontal rate, as people called it, um, it would just open up more opportunities for Hopkins, which we kind of saw week one. Um, we saw Christian Kirk get a bunch of those downfield shots. And then week two comes about, Moore is getting more action in the game, and he's getting downfield shots too. And he might be one of the fastest men in the league. Who's to say? I'm sure I could look it Definitely. up, but I don't really want to. However, I might want to change my 
change my tide soon. Give me another week or two, but I might be changing and calling Cardinals to win that division. The defense I mean, looks incredible so far too, which was kind of might be the, uh, that's the surprise right there. That's oh, the surprise. <laughs> as if he had planned this all along. I, I, I mean, was the surprised Vikings he... almost beat them. So yeah. not the best sign for them. <laughs> Did the Vikings win? Just saying, not the best sign. Are the Cardinals 2 0? Are they tied for first in their division? These are all questions we should be answering next on Sportball. Should we be? <laughs> uh, I got to say, Arizona looks good. And Great. they really have depth at wide receiver now with that pick and with AJ Green coming into the fold. I keep forgetting that AJ's even the team. <laughs> I mean, now they have Hopkins, Moore. AJ Green and Christian Kirk, four good to elite receivers that they can target, right? And we've really seen that open up the offense in the first couple of weeks. Um, Kyler looks like the early MVP that we all knew he could be. You know, I mean, he was great before his injury last year, and we're just seeing that it's injury free. He's one of the best players in the league, you know. And I feel like for some reason, getting Kenyon Drake out of there has really opened up their offense too. It feels like they don't, they're not thinking about like just running the ball nearly as much. Well, like not just did. running it right up the middle like they were trying to some some of these times with with Drake, but they're getting Chase out in the open and getting him passes underneath a lot more than they are just handing him the ball. Anytime you can get a player out of there that led the NFL in goal to go carries and also perhaps <laughs> the worst efficiency in goal to go carries, then I think you improve your team. So. <laughs> Seth, any, any thoughts on Rondell Moore and the Arizona Cardinals? You just watched them closely last week against the Vikings. I do not expect Rondell Moore to have an all-star level season the rest of the way. There are no all-stars in football, you fool. Exactly. What do you want to so – what are we betting on this? This sounds yeah. like he's trying to make – It sounds like you guys got a bet. Right now. You guys I just know what it is. <laughs> do I, guys I don't know if we like should do receiving like, yards or something? Over, pull what his over under is. I don't even know. Do they have <laughs> over unders like listed for him? Fantasy, fantasy points, or I don't know. We could do like fantasy, uh, um, top where he ends the yeah season if he's like a top twenty receiver or something fantasy wise. Yeah, I'll bet you want top twenty. Yeah, Cal, I mean, if you're gonna 25. give me twenty five, <laughs> <laughs> I think you go twenty five. I'll take twenty five. I would take that too if it's twenty five. I'll hop on with for me or for you. Are you on the Rondo side? No, I'm on the on Rondo. I think Rondo is going to be a great player, but rookie season, I'm not sure he'll be top 25. So I'll hop on with 15 each. Great. Sure. Book it. Put in your notes. Finally, the fact that we first it it took two weeks to get us to do this. Embarrassing. The first bet of the new sport ball season. I know our listeners have been craving it. You know and I am I still waiting on my mug from last year, Kyle, and I have been not expecting it at all, which is weird. So it's I don't delivered. know why I haven't shown up. <laughs> <laughs> you know how uh, great this feels to double down on an Arizona receiver not named DeAndre Hopkins to be a top 25 fantasy receiver? It after shouldn't Christian feel great. Kirk just <laughs> getting injured last year and, and still missing or and only missing by like four spots. How good does it feel? I'm not sure. <laughs> is that the question? Uh, yeah, I couldn't I even really begin to tell you. I lost sure. track of that. I just right. felt like yeah, he was like all the hype was on Rondell Moore. And I was like, okay, half of his production came from one play where it was just a complete lapse defensively, yeah. like miscommunication. And the throw was in the air and Rondell is standing, waiting for the ball, <laughs> waiting and waiting and catches it. And then still has time to turn and run and score. That was like we're how doing full open. point PPR, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's for sure true, Seth. But his best skill is speed, so he's going to get some balls like that for sure. We'll see about the yeah. consistency of you know of less deep catches. All right, let's keep moving. I'm going to give you my second surprise. Is everyone ready? God, tell us, please. <laughs> the Carolina Panthers of Carolina, not the Cardinals of Carolina, as Kyle may have alluded to earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, not a surprise for Seth. Damn straight. We picked them to make the playoffs in the preview podcast, and they are now 2-0 with a great win over the Saints week two. 
and perhaps a less impressive win over the Jets week one. But, you know, you got you to gotta beat the team that's in front of you, I always say. Um, it's not so much Sam Darnold, who has been a surprise to me, who has been he of many discussions over the offseason. I mean, he kind of is who I thought he would be in this offense. I mean, he's been fine, pretty good. You know, he has three touchdowns, one interception, eight yards per attempt. A very, you know, a good quarterback, you might say. So he's right in there where I thought he would be, where he's better than than Jets, Sam Darnold, and he's not Patrick Mahomes. So I think that's to be expected. Um, it's really a defense that has been a surprise to me. Okay. They have 21 points allowed in two games, which is much better than the Falcons' 80 points allowed in two games, you might say. Can't uh, argue with that. They're first in DVOA, which you know I love. And I kind of knew, you know, we'd been hearing about how the Carolina Panthers have an up and coming defense, a young, you know, some young studs on their defense. I guess I wasn't expecting it to happen this soon, right? Where they're already the best defense in the league through two weeks. Uh, They got Brian Burns on the, on the defensive end and they have um, their new free agent Hassan Reddick has been playing well for them. So that defense has been elite so far. And Sam Darnold has done enough to keep the offense humming. And they're 2-0. and oh. So I think, you know, as far as it's sustaining, I think the defense is very sustainable. I'm not looking at a 17-0 and 0 team here, but I think that them making the playoffs is pretty reasonable, which I maybe wasn't fully on board with as far as Seth's take at the beginning of the season. So I've hopped on board your bandwagon, Seth. Welcome, welcome. to you with open arms. Yes, you're, you're welcome anytime. Um, I'll be driving, though. You think I want to drive? No. DJ Moore is once again going to quietly, somehow quietly, be a top 10 receiver for like the fourth year in a row. <laughs> yeah. He's just – He's, he's, the, he's the more you want. Forget Rondell. So there you go. Imagine DJ if Rondell, Rondell was on this team. My goodness. <laughs> Super Bowl uh, – Super Bowl front runners. So what do you guys think? I mean, I know Seth, you agree with it, and Kyle, you're kind of on board with that, but yeah, I'm sure I, that they, they've looked great to you guys as well. No, I'm definitely on board with that. I'm pretty sure last time we met, I said that uh they would be one of the wild wild card spots if I had to kick one of the other teams I wasn't so sure about. Um I mean you got a healthy McCaffrey. That right there does a ton. <laughs> DJ. I mean, Terrace hasn't even taken off yet. And a great defense. Yeah. What do you need? Yeah, they have a lot of weapons on offense. That's for sure. And I think they're waiting for that defense to catch up. You know? I mean, that defense showed a lot of flashes last year. They just weren't consistent. Exactly. If they're going to exactly. be consistent this year, watch out. Just like you said. Pray for the league, I would say. All right, well, I know that wasn't a surprise to you guys. So, Kyle, why don't you give me a second surprise? Oh, what if I told you <laughs> I didn't have a surprise? Any more surprises left? Um, so your one surprise was the player that you loved going into the season being good. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> this is absolutely outrageous. I'll, I'll help Kyle stall here. I can do my okay. next one. Please. Um, all right, what if I told you <laughs> that the <laughs> NFC West might actually be decent? That's the opposite of a surprise. How so, is that the opposite of a surprise? Isn't the NFC West supposed to be the best division in the league? That's what we were saying last time we met. Oh, okay, I didn't mean the West then. One second. <laughs> what? He has to look up means, which division is which. You think he means the north <laughs> or the east? A, this is a sports podcast. Yeah, I think he means. And the east. your point is, you think I've memorized the names of the divisions? They yeah, it's not that all. hard. <laughs> I mean, I'm with Seth them. here. I'm with Seth here. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you either without looking. All right, Sam, <laughs> name the teams in the AFC South. Okay, Tennessee, Indianapolis, Jacksonville, Houston Texans. All right, good work. You passed. It's the, not that hard. <laughs> Okay, I was talking about the NFC East. I know you were. 
So what if I told you they might actually all like the division might be decent? I would say everyone but the Giants, right? I mean. Yeah, and going in, we thought both Philly and the Giants would be ass, and Washington and Dallas would be uh, competing for the division and maybe 500 team would win, right? How dare you put that on me? I said the NFC East is going to be good this year with two playoff teams and the, and the AFC South will be the worst division in the league. So all our listeners remember that. I'm sure they will. Um, (laughs) So I thought they would be ass again this year and you know, at least half the time so far, Jalen Hurts has looked like an all-star QB. Um, Damn straight. And he played I in Alabama that. for a reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I expect that to continue. And I mean, I like Jalen Hurts going into the year, like in fantasy. So I don't know necessarily why I thought Philly would be bad. And obviously, they lost in week two. Um, but Dallas looks better than I expected as well. Um, I think there was just a lot of talk, Eagles-wise, of is Rager actually going to live up to what he was? Is Devonta Smith going to be what he was in college? And having that, that many question marks at the wide receiver position with a quarterback that only had, what, four starts out of his right. rookie year? I mean, I get it. I get why people were... Well, and they have a new head coach that we weren't sure about, right? He was kind of an out-there coach that we weren't sure if the team was going to buy into it or not. Yeah, Sirianni. So it seems like they have. And their defense, I don't think we really talked about their defense as a possible elite unit coming into the season, but they have kind of been that so far. So, I mean, are they a playoff team? Maybe not. Are they, you know, a mediocre team? Probably, but better than we expected, right? I mean, yeah. their defense has given up the second least amount of points in the league behind none other than Carolina. Carolina. <laughs> you know who's given up the most, though? My Falcons, baby. Yeah, so I think your assessment is correct, Seth. Uh, I think Washington and Dallas are who we perhaps thought they were, maybe Dallas being a little better. And um, the Eagles are better than expecting. The Giants are probably bad. We'll see what happens against my beloved Falcons, but... I don't, I don't think this is going to be the worst division in the league again this year. And the other surprising, I mean, yeah, I think the other thing to mention with Washington is Brian Fitzpatrick's injury, and they still got to win with Taylor Heineke now. But who was it against? It was against the Giants. <laughs> the team. Pound the under people. <laughs> just saying, is ass. And they won by one point. So <laughs> who knows? Maybe Washington, especially. I mean, that was a big part of why we said that Washington had a good chance at winning the division was they have some good offensive weapons, the good defense, um, and a competent quarterback with Ryan Fitzpatrick. So can Heineke be competent? I don't know. Don't have a lot yeah. of confidence in that. Um, but I think overall the division is – better than I expected it. Can't speak. The real question regarding Washington is when are they just going to trade for Jimmy Garoppolo? Yeah. Kyle brought this up to me when we were watching a game together. And I was like, that actually makes a lot of sense. You know, if, when the, if, and when the 49ers are looking to move him, I was a little surprised they weren't looking for any other quarterbacks that are out there to start over Heineke. They're like, Oh yeah. Heineke is our starter. We're fine. You know, Cam Newton's out there, et cetera. I guess Trubisky is probably available as a backup. (laughs) Don't even mention his name on this podcast. I was having a good day until he did that. Uh, All right, Kyle, are you ready with your second surprise? It would surprise me if you were. Yes. So for as much as Seattle fans love Russell Wilson, I have seen a lot over the last like two days since that game against Tennessee a lot of backlash on like Twitter and social media in regards to Russ's decision-making so far this season. A lot of, a lot of people have been saying that he lost the game against Tennessee by trying to make these hero-esque throws to lock it downfield 
instead of just picking up, you know, first downs when needed or when he could to someone underneath Gerald Everett, whoever it may be. And that's been probably one of the biggest surprises I've seen so far, because I feel like, you know, Russ is that quarterback that everybody loves and to see him getting backlash over, you know, taking those shots that we've wanted him and been clamoring for him to take for years. And he's finally doing it. It's like, it seems like he has that. Um, well, I guess they started off last year the same way, letting Russ cook and making those plays and all that good stuff. I mean, he connected with Lockett how many times 30 plus yards down the field that game and to give him flack for doing it in overtime to try and seal the games just doesn't it, it's, it's weird to me. You know, it's surprising, some might say. Are you surprised by this? Well, Seth, I would like to throw it to you to defend your boy and the Twitter against the Twitter trolls of our nation. Yeah, I would agree that that is surprising and unwarranted. Um, the only play that really comes to mind, kind of a different category than what Kyle was talking about, was right at the end of the game. Um, he, he, there were, were defensive linemen <laughs> going. We've been invaded. Watch out. Everyone hold your kids, <laughs> hold your wife. <laughs> the attack starts now. <laughs> well, while Seth is stalling, I'm trying to figure out where this sound is coming from. <laughs> I have to say that, you know, the the Seahawks have that new offensive coordinator, Shane Waldron from the Lions, or not the Lions. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> from the Rams. Wouldn't surprise and, me to see Carol <laughs> doing such a thing. I mentioned before the season that maybe we could see that open up the offense for the Seahawks, right? And I think so far the results have been pretty good. Um, and yep. it was obvious that Russ wanted him, right, and wanted the kind of offense that he was going to draw up for them. Uh, I think the biggest issue has been their defense, at least yeah, not Don't let Derrick game. Henry run for 200-something yards against you. Yeah, the second game. I mean, easier said than done, you know, when you're dealing with a man that's more alien than human. But, yeah, agreed. The defense was the problem in the last game. So what I was going to say before I was rudely interrupted by a spontaneous Pizza Hut commercial <laughs> uh, is Russ was trying to avoid a sack and he did that thing where he ran back, like got almost to his goal line, got kind of spun around, tried to throw it away. Honestly, I think it should have been a safety. And, but they called it down on the one yard line. I think it should have either been a safety or an incomplete pass. I didn't really get it. Anyways, you know, that was one of the ones where he probably should have thrown it away earlier than that. But that's kind of a different complaint than I think what Kyle was referencing on Twitter. And yeah, I felt like the Seahawks fell short more defensively in that game where they just couldn't stop Derrick Henry in the second half. And to be honest, even as a Seahawk fan, I was kind of happy that the Titans won that game just because they deserved it. And they got completely jobbed on a julio jones touchdown thank god i have the opportunity to bring this up even though it's let me stop you right there because it's going to tie in perfectly to my next surprise and i'll throw to you after i'm in the middle of it okay i'll allow it my third surprise has been the referees have been even worse than one might expect going into the season and now i'm not one to complain about the refs okay you know that kyle's the one in this in this zoom call that complains about the refs most Right, Kyle? We're talking basketball, definitely. <laughs> so usually if someone's like, oh, the refs cost this team the game, I'm like, all right. You know, they made a lot of mistakes in that game. It didn't come down to the referees. And maybe this is more of an NFL rules problem than the referees themselves, and they're just trying to uphold them. But there's been several complaints I have. Um, number one, the taunting calls. That seems like more of an NFL rules thing, but what are we doing here? You know, if a- – <laughs> If a cornerback claps his hands at a receiver after he makes a pass break up, that's taunting suddenly. Does anyone, did anyone have a problem with that beforehand? Were we all sitting on our couches being like, oh my God, how dare he clap at that receiver? I wish there were a penalty for that. 
I mean, I assume someone had a problem with it. That's <laughs> why the rule was changed or the you know point of emphasis. I'd like to but know who I that can. was and call him up. If it's Roger himself, I'll call him right now. If I uh, hear it, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. So that's been a little frustrating to me. It really just stops the game and like, like, oh, what's the penalty for? Oh, we clapped at him? Okay. Um, the other thing I've had an issue with is it seems like this year they're trying to uphold the calls on the field more than in the past. So if there's a review, they're like, we're not overturning this unless like it's very, very clear, extremely clear without a reasonable shadow of a doubt that the call should be changed. That's what I've been told from the announcers this season. That's a new thing for them. Okay. And it has led to some questionable calls um, where I thought they should have been overturned, but they didn't because they were too nervous to overturn the call on the field. And yet, this Julio Jones play that Seth was was referencing, he was called in for a touchdown on the field, and they overturned it with what I think is far unsubstantial evidence because there was he had his feet in. evidence <laughs> confirming that it was a touchdown. Just yes. describe the play, Seth. Tell me about it. Yeah. So for those who didn't see it, Julio Jones catches a pass in the back of the end zone. First foot is in, second foot, his toe lands inbounds, heel lands right close to the line, which apparently there's a rule that that is somehow different than when someone does a toe tap or like dragging their toes on their way out of bounds. I don't understand how you could distinguish between those because obviously your heel will touch the ground at some point when you land. Well, I will say that part his makes sense. His heel was to me. still in, though. Right. His right. heel was still we'll in. So none that. of that matters. I will say that part makes sense to me. When you're tapping your toes, your heel doesn't really land first. Your body lands first. You tap your toes and then you fall out of bounds. When, you, when you're planting your foot, your toe and then your heel plants. So it's a different motion. So that makes sense to me. But none of that matters because his heel was in and they overturned it for no reason. I don't see how, I, I mean, I agree the motion is different. I don't see how that should make a difference as to whether you're in bounds or not. Uh, no, so definitely. Maybe, if his toe is in, if your toe is in, you're in bounds. You're in bounds. I would say. And in this case, always been the rule. I thought not only was both toes in, both heels were also in, bounds, <laughs> as we had indisputable photographic evidence that you can find online. The man's entire body was in. Okay. And then they <laughs> called it out of bounds, anyways. And it it almost was a moment to me. The only explanation that I could possibly think of is this ref or the replay people, or whatever wanted to show that there is this obscure NFL rule where your heel lands out of bounds and it's not a toe tap. If your heel lands out of bounds right after your toe, then it's out of bounds. Like they wanted to demonstrate that and they thought, oh, here's my opportunity to show that this <laughs> rule exists. Let's overturn it, even though his heel was inbounds and there was clearly not evidence, indisputable evidence, right? So. That was some bullshit. Uh, I saw the replay one time and I thought, oh, his heel's in. All right. Like, why are they taking so long? And then they overturned it. And then later on, there's like a photograph where you can clearly see a line of green, you know, in between his foot and the white line of out of bounds. So that was just despicable to me. And it's uh, even worse after they told us that they're trying not to overturn calls on the field and reviews right. anymore. The only thing that I can think of that was as bad from a referee standpoint was when in one of the Golden State games, Kevin Durant had taken like four steps out of bounds to save the ball and then got it, <laughs> threw it back in, and the refs didn't call anything. And it was But like, they didn't even review that one. That would be like if yeah. they reviewed it and said he was still in bounds. <laughs> yeah. It was like in the fourth row of the stands and trying yeah. to get the ball back. He in. was actually sitting with the crowd and they're like, ah, he's yeah. fine. Yeah, so, you know, like I said, I'm not one to complain about the rest, but it has been pretty bad so far in those two areas, you know. And as far as going forward, I'd like to say it'll improve, but I have my doubts. So, cautiously optimistic. Uh, Kyle, Seth, have you gotten all your three surprises out? I have. All right, so get out. You can leave. Kyle, go ahead. See ya. <laughs> okay. Last surprise for me. Not least, though, right? Yeah. Honestly, no, no, no. The most surprising of all of them. Is this an actual surprise now? Or is this yes, another? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're two games into the season. 
obviously. Derrick Henry has almost just under half as many uh, receptions as he had last year altogether. Mm. We thought that is a right, good one. they, you know, they've never wanted to throw the Derrick Henry. Just they never do it. He had 30 total targets last year, 24 the year before. We're through two games and he already has 10 targets and nine receptions. If he is going to keep this up, there's no doubt in my mind that he ends up fantasy wise as the RB one. Cause I don't think there's any other running back in the league that could as easily drop a 220 rush yard game. And then you're going to toss in four to five receptions a game. Get out of town here. Because if I knew that, he would have been a first-round pick, I feel like, everywhere if he wasn't. I don't know if he was everywhere. Yeah, he was a first-round pick, but maybe first overall or, you know, second behind McCaffrey. Yeah. So, I mean, if the Titans are going to keep doing this, I mean, I guess it makes sense if you think about it. Um, really, do they want to pass multiple times a game to Ferkser? Probably not. Julio Jones, you know, you thought he would absorb a decent amount of targets, and he has. But on top of the Derrick Henry situation, what's happening to Arthur Juan Brown? The man can't catch this year. The Titans in the hole are a surprise to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, are we saying A.J. Brown's full name? Yeah. Got it. Uh, Much like Jose Juan Barea, his name is Arthur Juan Brown. <laughs> Well, you know, you throw to Julio for a touchdown, they don't call it. So what are you going to do? You got to throw Derek after that. <laughs> yeah, I have. A, that's a great that's a great one. And I wonder if that's a maybe um, one of the from bright behind, spots. Yeah. yeah, that too. And maybe one of the bright spots of Arthur Smith leaving. Maybe he was, you know, not a proponent of that. And the new Alfonso coordinator is, is kind of working that in more. Um and yeah, I bet the loss of uh, tight end John Smith has a lot to do with that too. And those those short yardage situations, they don't have that blanket to to lay on. You might say, um, but that'll be interesting moving forward. Because as we know, running backs don't matter unless they catch the ball, unless you're Derek Henry truth. and run for two hundred yards. But yeah, I think you know, from what we've seen, I stand by my decision to say the AFC South will be the worst division in the, in the league. But I think the Titans will easily win this division, even if they have a, a mediocre record, right? I mean, you see the Colts have an injured Carson Wentz, and the Texans and the Jaguars aren't going to be very good. So, I mean, the Texans are one and one. Who's to say what happens if Tyrod didn't go out? Could be two and up. Who's that's to say? true. That could, they could be. All right, so I think we've all given our three surprises, right? Yeah. I have one more quick segment that I uh, that I cooked up, but I didn't tell you guys about. It always says it's going to be a quick segment. It never is. There's no such thing as a quick segment on a sport ball podcast. Here we go. Ready? It's uh, we are who they thought they were. They are who we thought they were? <laughs> Correct. Uh, things that weren't surprises at all in any way shape or fashion wow and it's loosely based on the they are who we thought they were rant (laughs) about the bears okay i'm gonna start off with the jags and the jets oh and two with rookie quarterbacks expected right yeah carson Wentz, the aforementioned of course has allowed six sacks and also sprained both his ankles I don't think he's allowed that, but they've happened. <laughs> we could all see that coming, am I right? <laughs> the you know NFC West. You know what I saw the other day? What'd you Someone say? said, I could describe any Carson Wentz play to someone that knows football without saying the name Carson Wentz and ask them what quarterback did that, and they would guess <laughs> Carson Wentz. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> uh and finally, the NFC West, aforementionedly mentioned in this podcast as the NFC East, uh, are seven and one. Yeah. So it yep. should be eight, no, honestly. <laughs> yeah, really. That's very true. So is it though? It is true. Yeah. I mean the Seahawks probably should have won that game, right? 
No, if anything, the Titans should have won after we talked about the whole thing with Julio. Jesus. Oh, that's true. That's very true, actually. Yeah. No, I don't listen to our own podcast. Who would? We only have five listeners. So that's uh, We Are Who They Thought They Were, a new recurring segment, I presume, on this podcast. Thoughts? Early early returns on that segment? I hope it's not recurring. (laughs) (laughs) As all the listeners would. You didn't want to put the Raiders in there? So I actually had Raiders in honorable guys. mentions. Um, They're not who we it, thought they were, though. They have, yeah, I put them in honorable mentions for surprises, but I'm really not that surprised. I mean, they've beaten the Ravens and the Steelers, two of our playoff teams, so that's pretty impressive. But they always, I mean, they often start out well and fade down the stretch. Even last season, they started out six and three and finished at eight and eight, including <laughs> including a forty three to six loss to the fucking Falcons, who we know are the worst team in the league, and no one picked them to make the playoffs <laughs> this year. So. I don't know. You know what? Let's just see if this continues. You know, I'm, I'm not surprised if they're out strong. I will be surprised if they're a playoff team, I guess, is what I would say. According to announcers for Raiders games, whether it's on national television or not, Derek Carr is the best quarterback in football. Dude, I cannot yeah. stand these announcers <laughs> sucking Derek off every time. They're like, oh, you know who's underrated? That's how they start off the game. And then he'll throw like a pick and they'll be like, oh, wow. The receiver, I can't believe he moved that way. And then he'll take a terrible sack in the red zone. They'll be like, oh, the offensive line. I just he's fine. Okay. He's fine. Sure. Just is he leading the league of... in passing guard so far? Sure. But he's still <laughs> fine. I just can't get the one play out of my head against Baltimore at the end of the first half, where they were in the red zone, had eight seconds left and one timeout. And it was first down. And Carr decided to scramble out of the pocket gained about two yards after getting tackled from behind (laughs) had to immediately call a timeout with one second left on the clock. And the announcer said, what an incredible job extending that play by Derek Carr. (laughs) He's like Kirk cousins with better PR. That's what he is. I mean, he's honestly Kirk should pay for his P uh, he's like his PR people. Well, he needs it. I mean, what is Derek Carr? Like the 14th, 15th best quarterback in the league like we all know what he is why do we Teddy's have to, definitely better than him why do we have to lament like he's overrated or underrated well, he is what he, he is that's still like 30 spots higher than Kirk Cousins so <laughs> yeah I mean easily he's taking but, over the reins from Mitch Trubisky as being the ninth best quarterback in the division so <laughs> <laughs> Big all right well that <laughs> that was our NFL two-week Surprise, summer blowout, bonanza, trademarked, restricted. TM. <laughs> Any parting thoughts for our five listeners? I uh, I got a call back today. I will be getting a new tattoo finally in three weeks. Wow, is it a Rondo Moore on your ass? How'd you know? Close. It's Rondo squatting 600 pounds when he was in high when he was in college as a freshman. When I what flex my cheek, it's going to be him squatting. <laughs> what is it actually? Our listeners deserve to know. Yeah, it's a memorial tattoo for my grandfather. Nice. We'll reveal it on air. I did tell wow. Megan, however, that I wanted to get a tattoo right here. Mm-hmm. That just said sheesh. So I didn't have to say it and I could just point to it and people would know. Oh my God. I think that's a winner. I mean, the thing is, this man invented the sheesh trend and no one talks about that. In, this man was saying the, sheesh like, I don't know, high school? six years ago. Yeah. <laughs> or right out of high school. Yeah. I've been sheeshing all my life. <laughs> this man came out of the womb, looked at the nurse, said sheesh. <laughs> now people on TikTok think they invented it. Come on now. Yeah. Who are they? Yeah. There it is. That's it. Seth, I know you have no parting words. 